Hey everyone, welcome to the last lecture on my course for game music for composers. This time we're going to be talking about game music business. And like these happy people here, we're going to hopefully try to get into the industry, enjoy ourselves, make some money, and have a good time and, you know, try to help people out and try to, yeah, make good, make a good career for ourselves. All right, so this lecture will copy, it will um, cover how to get started in the industry, how much to charge, things like contracts, uh, intellectual property, invoicing. Um, mostly it's about getting started in the industry, how to set yourself up. Um, these last two, uh, there's not as much um, detail on that. So it won't be, it's not going to be very dry and boring. It's mostly going to be what, what to do to get yourself set up. And a lot of this comes from this absolutely fantastic website um, by Matt Kenyon on his Composer Code website, um, and I've linked it just here. I'll put a link in the description as well. Uh, How to become a composer for video games in 2022 is the name of that page. So it's fantastic. I learned a lot from it, and um, a lot of what I have here is, has come from him or other sources that are yeah, around. Okay, getting started in the game industry. So firstly, as a composer, we need to build up an online presence. Uh, if someone goes to search for your name, find out who, who you are or what you do and they don't find anything uh, it's it's not great they it doesn't help them at all they, they need to be able to see who you are what you do and listen to your music all that kind of stuff so they need to be able to find that stuff online pretty easily and before you start setting up an online presence you kind of want to work out what your brand is so what kind of music are you good at what, what kind of music do you like to write so for example if you like writing full or orchestra in kind of a romantic style, um, then you, and you've really focused on that, you've studied a lot of orchestration and worked a lot in your DAW to get a really good orchestral template, those kind of things, uh, that might be part of your brand, you know, I, I write that big lush orchestral sound. Um, whereas other people might be, you know, I, I focus on chip tunes, I'm really, really good at family tracker, I can do amazing stuff with the NES. Um, so everyone has their own kind of uh, brand or, or thing they're good at. Some people do a bit of everything, um, and that's it's not a bad thing to do. It's good to know different styles and different genres, uh, but specialization is usually recommended. Um, if you're the guy that can do everything, um, people will come to you and they want something very, very specific. They want some dark gothic um, soundtrack or, or some um, synth wave kind of... Uh, cyberpunk style soundtrack and they come to you and they see that you can do you're doing like singer songwriter choral stuff um i don't know didgeridoo improvisation or something they'll be like well maybe this isn't the right guy for me even if among your 20 different albums there is one with the right style they might listen to three or four and then say well this guy does a lot of sorts, sorts of random stuff maybe he's not or she isn't the right one for me um, so it's usually good to, sp to specialize and try to create a very specific um kind of brand for yourself. And I know guys like Stephen Malin, they have a very um, specific uh, style. Like for example, I, th I think Stephen Malin is, um, you know, music for 2D um, Metroidvanias or 2D kind of um, uh, a action games, that kind of thing. Uh, so he specializes in that kind of brand. That's his brand. Uh, whereas me, I'm more into combining unusual instruments and kind of creating a unique sound for each game, I guess. I don't do really, really big orchestral stuff, although I, I could, um, but mostly I like to have kind of a chamber group of unusual instruments, you know, bassoon, NES synth, some weird bits and pieces, and create a kind of a hybrid that fits the, the game I'm working on. Um, and I'm more of a, I do more of a dark style. I prefer like, you know, horror and uh, more darker fantasy or military stuff. That's kind of my my brand that I'm trying to go for. And when you set yourself up, you really want uh, a band camp or a um, SoundCloud showing all your work, uh, a website, uh, and portfolio videos. So a website, uh, in order to create a website, you probably want to pay a designer, a web, web designer, if you, if you don't feel you could do it yourself. Um, web design is quite specialized, and although you can find good programs like Squarespace and such like um, to kind of create a website for you. It's You're going to get the best results if you pay a designer. Um, and your website is kind of like 
the first port of call if someone's trying to research you and find out what kind of music you do. If you have a really, really good website, it looks really clean and amazing, people will instantly say, oh, this guy's professional, or this girl's professional. Um, so it's really, it's money well spent if you spend, if you pay a designer to do a really, really good job and have a, a beautiful looking website. And that's kind of what will put the pros apart from the amateurs, you know? You've got a website and you see it's very poorly put together, you'll say, ah, well, maybe this, the, probably this guy's music is, is poorly put together as well. So it's a very, very important indicator for a game dev as to uh, what to expect in terms of quality. Um, it's a good thing to research websites of other composers. Um, whenever I see a composer post something on Twitter or something, I, I usually go and I check out their website to try to see, okay, well, what does their website look like? Um, and, it, and some of them are very, very good, and I, I've been meaning to save them in a file, but I always seem to forget to save them. So um, from now on, I'm gonna create a file and just save all the cool websites that I see, and then I can go back to them and refer to them. And when I do a website redesign at some point, I'll reference those or say to a web designer, say, hey, I want something like this. It's very clean, the way he's um, done these icons at the bottom or whatever it is. Um, the way there's a video in the background, a very subtle video that just slowly moves or something like that. Um, so it's good to check out websites of other composers, see what people do. Um, and it needs to be very clean and accessible. And ideally, the most important thing it needs to do is show off your music. So you need to have music very clearly visible or videos very clearly visible. You shouldn't have to navigate to the sixth page and then go down, scroll down to see a video. It should be right there when you when you open up on the landing page. Now for portfolio videos, you probably want something on YouTube or Vimeo. Uh, you probably want something about five minutes long, much longer than that. Pe people aren't gonna watch 10, 20 minutes of your showreel um, or your portfolio. About five minutes is probably fine. Three to four minutes is also fine. And just showcase kind of the best of your recent works. And it could be around a minute per track, or maybe 30, 40 seconds. Um, and ideally have some gameplay footage there. Uh, if you're just starting out, you probably want to use like some free videos from websites such as Pexels, P-E-X-E-L-S dot -E com. I believe it is. I'll put the link below as well. Uh, you can get free videos from there, quite nice looking videos, just kind of abstract stuff. Um, and just try to match your music to some kind of video and have them blend together nicely. You probably want to get a decent video editing software because it's quite important to be able to create videos as a composer. Um, so putting together a portfolio of videos is very, very useful. And I've got jobs just from having a good portfolio that I've sent to someone, they've sent to someone else and that person says, oh, okay, yep, I'll hire that guy. So it's quite important. It's almost like your business card, um, online, online business card. Um, and Another question you probably want to ask is, do you want to be a freelancer or do you want to work in-house? Now in-house is where you're actually hired by a game company and you go and you physically work there, uh, maybe not in this day and age, actually physically be there. You might have to, might be working from home um, if there's COVID issues or such like. But essentially it's that trade-off between, do you want to be paid a salary and work in a company or do you want to be a freelance composer and have more control over which kind of projects you get, but you're going to have a lot less financial stability. And you need to be very careful in how you save and plan and uh, um, financially. Um, so it's kind of a trade-off. If you work in-house, you pretty much have to work on what they tell you to work on. And if it's a, if you like the game company a lot, that's probably going to be great. You're going to be saying, okay, great, these are the games these guys make are really, really cool, and I'm always interested. Um, and you're going to have a lot more financial stability. Um, you go to work every day, you do your thing. Um, and you get your salary every month, whatever it is. Whereas freelance, you can pick your pick your jobs more carefully. You can pick exactly the things you want to work on, um, but you might have big gaps of a couple months where you're not making any money, and you need to be able to survive those um, those gaps. It's kind of like feast or famine a little bit with being a freelancer. You might get paid ten grand and then have six months with nothing or whatever it is. Um, so you need to develop strategies to deal with that. And there's a link there to the Composer Code uh, site um, as to how to get gigs, uh, which is uh, very, very cool. That's, the site is invaluable to composers, um, especially in the game industry. Okay, your Bandcamp. You want to build up a body of work. This could be Bandcamp, this could be SoundCloud, or whichever other um, website you want to go for. Now, if you're just starting out and you don't have too much uh, content, you can just, just try something. Just write a concept album for a game you like to score or rescore a game that you love, you know? Find, um, 
you know, an old game that you think is really cool or a new game and you say, okay, I'm going to write a new score for it. I'll do 10 tracks to set yourself a project and start and put, put together and that'll give you something, you know, a little album there. And suddenly people say, oh, look, he can do a, a whole album in the style of Metal Gear Solid or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, if you don't have any work at the moment um, and you're trying to build up a, a body of work, just, just do projects you like, do things you enjoy. Go offer to do the soundtrack to, I don't know, some Doom mod or whatever indie game you can find who, who doesn't have a budget for audio. Just say, hey, I'll, look, I'll write you a soundtrack. I need to build up some stuff, so let's do it. Get out there, try to find projects, or just create your own, you know? Create a concept album. Just invent a game and say, okay, I'm going to make a, a soundtrack for some um, game set in, you know, 16th century Spain. And it's going to be all like um, vocal music in the style of Cristobal de, de Morales or whatever it is. Um, so you can go and, and just, just find a, a project that interests you and, and try to do it to the end. Get five or six tracks at least. Now, album covers are important. Um, people come to your SoundCloud or to your um, Bandcamp, they're going to see all these little images. And people are very visual. They want to be able to um, see something interesting. That'll draw them in and then they'll want to click on it. Um, so hire an artist if you need to. If you feel your graphic design skills aren't um, that great, uh, you can check out things like Fiverr.com or um, there's a few other websites where you can hire people um, and just hire an artist and say, hey, look, I need uh, an album cover for this concept album I created. Um, you might pay 10 bucks, you might pay 50 bucks, whatever you can spare, and they'll, they'll, they'll whip something up for you. Um, personally, I do pretty much all this myself. I'm maybe not the best graphic designer, but I have quite a bit of experience from publishing uh, tabletop war games, and so I can... This one here probably isn't that great, but some of them are, are okay. As long as you can see a title and have an interesting image, um, you can usually find free images online and um, put something together. So yeah, so that's that's my Bandcamp. Um, got a few different uh, projects there, different albums. Uh, some of these are actually asset packs I put together just from old tracks. Some of these are actual games I worked on. Runes of Kellerworm, Perdition's Gate, uh, Skateria. These are all games I scored. And some of them are just like concepts al albums, um, elementalism I scored as well. And these, this one I just wanted to do some orchestral music in the style of Medal of Honor. So I thought, okay, well, let's just try and do it. So I started putting together an album for that and just, there's only two tracks there, but yeah, I can add to it as I continue. Okay, now social media is also very important. Uh, it's great for finding game developers and for getting feedback on your work. You can... Uh, post what you're working on, uh, share regularly, and as you keep sharing every week or every day or how, how, however often you want to, you're gonna to start to build up a following. Each time you share something, someone's gonna follow you or someone's gonna like it and, and share it and you'll, you'll slowly build up a following. And the bigger you're following, the more likely work will come to you. Um, if you have a Twitter account with you know a million followers and, and you post some great music, some game dev's gonna be following you and say, hey man, this looks awesome. You wanna score my game? You know? So it's good to build up a following on social media, whether that's Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok as well is quite good for getting views. Um, so yeah, for example, Twitter is is quite important, I think. Um, I only recently joined, maybe a year or two ago, uh, but there's heaps of game developers there, lots and lots of cool projects. I got a job just from someone saying I need music, and I just posted saying, hey, here's my music, and uh, he hired me straight away. So it's really good to be on there and check out projects you like. Excuse me. Uh, so you want to make use of things like Screenshot Saturday, the hashtag, um, and just can post a piece you've been working on every Saturday. Uh, post a little video showing your DAW working or some um, some kind of you know abstract video in the background with your music. Or even better, some gameplay footage. And um, yeah, uh, people will, you know, they'll, be sort of, they'll see the Screenshot Saturday stuff come up and they'll say, wow, this is great. Uh, Portfolio Day is also another good uh, hashtag. Um, I think they're at certain times, like certain Tuesdays throughout the month. You'd have to check um, exactly which dates those are. But that's a good time to share your music portfolio. Um, and tagging things like indie dev, game music, game audio, indie games, game design, such like. Using these hashtags in your post will give your post a bit more discoverability and Indie, people who follow indie dev or indie developers will will see your post and they'll say, oh, yeah, cool, there's some great music. Um, uh, Facebook as well is great. There's a lot of indie development and uh, game audio groups. And Discord is also uh, really cool. 
there's a, a great Discord that was only started recently um, where you can post music and get honest feedback um, on it. So that's that's pretty cool. I'll put a link in the description there as well. Okay, and it's really good to get feedback on your work. Um, you post something you feel really, really good about, and then you get feedback on it, and you make it even better, hopefully. Um, people are generally pretty honest, and they'll say, yeah, yeah, you know, this didn't sound great, or, or maybe you'll get really good feedback. People will say, wow, this sounded awesome, and, you know, it'll boost you up a bit and give you some confidence. So, yeah, I think it's really important to get feedback, and um, it's a good way to grow and, and get better at, at doing what we do. Okay, networking. You want to get involved in game jams if possible. Um, you can do this online, we can do it locally. Uh, it's a great way to see the whole process of a game. You see the start, you see um, coming up with ideas, you see the art coming together. Um, you can get in really involved in the process. You know, like last game jam I did, I ended up writing the story and coming up with the, the idea for the gameplay and um, doing foley and music, recording my partner walking around in some shoes to get some nice um, kind of footsteps. Um, and yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. I was doing lots of stuff, writing some story about some vampires and then writing some music. So it's a good way to get involved in, in the, kind of the whole process. Uh, it's a great way to work uh, to meet game developers. So you work with some guys for, for a weekend or uh, for, for a couple of weeks. And then they'll say, oh, this, is, this guy is awesome. This, this guy does great music. We should get him on when we start to do a more serious uh, project. Or, or if this game jam develops into a larger game, which does happen. Um, lots of games, such as Binding of Isaac, um, have started off as game jam games. Um, so it's really good to get involved and try something new, a new genre maybe, and make some friends. Um, that's what it's all about. Get involved and enjoy it and see what other people are up to. And you never know, you might find some people who have very, very similar interests and you totally gel and start making some really cool, cool stuff. Now itch.io has a lot of uh, game jams. You can go on there and there's just like hundreds of game jams happening at any one time. And they're usually different themes. There might be a horror one, there might be a low poly one. There might be an Unreal or a Godot jam you can get involved in. Yeah, just go on and check it out and see what's, what's coming up or what's on. And usually from there you can find a community post or a discord or something where you can actually advertise and say hey I'm looking for a group um, I do this music here's my music anyone um, interested and usually you can get assigned a group or join a group here in New Zealand we have the game jam Aotearoa um, which is every year and there's also other smaller um, game jams I know there's a local Dunedin uh, game jam um, and there's some other bits and pieces you can get involved in uh, and yeah, going to local meetups is another good one. This is kind of a good, uh, the game jams are kind of a good way to get involved online with different people. But obviously local meetups or traveling to conventions and such like are uh, very, very good way to network. Um, here in Dunedin we have uh, Dunedin Game Dev meetups, which are awesome. Head along, have a chat to people. There's always some interesting presentation uh, or two. Uh, see what people are working on. And then we head to the pub afterwards, have a beer. And it's just a great way to have a yarn and get to know people. And they say that um, being consistent is the way to do it. You know, turn up often, be be recognised. Uh, you know, that, oh, there, there's there's Tom again. He's he's back. Um, uh, I remember him from last time. Or I remember him from time from the other time. Um, and we had a good connection on this. And just just keep going, keep going. Don't just go and then leave it. Um, personally, I I need to get along to more of our local game dev meetups because I've managed to miss the last few, um, and I feel really bad about it. But I'm just exhausted. Um, but this week we've got two of them. I'm going to try to go to both. So I'll be there. Uh, it's also good to go along to just anything involved with the game game industry. Uh, for example, I went to a, like a, a, a new game dev business opening, um, and that was when I was first starting to get into game music, and I met a lot of cool people. And yeah, um, from that I managed to try to get into the local game industry and met some people and managed to get some work. So yeah, it was good. It was a really good thing to go to. So just yeah, check out the paper, see if anything's opening or if any interesting um, game dev things are going on, and that's a good. Good way to get involved. All right, once you've got your online presence uh, sorted out, now you can start pitching to game developers. And this is based on uh, this Composing Code uh, website. And I thought this was a really, really good, um, good way to do it. 
Now the first step is to find a project, uh, something that really excites you, um, and research that developer and the company. See, you know, how big is it? Is it one person working in their basement or is it a team of 50? Um, or is it like two or three people? Um, and make sure they don't already have a composer is usually a good idea. If they already have a composer, it's it can be it, it's probably very, very difficult to try and break in um, because they, they've already chosen someone, um, they already have a, a musical style there and they probably already have a relationship with that composer, so that they're not going to be looking to change. It'd be very, very unlikely um, that you could swoop in and, and steal their, that composer's job. And it's probably not really a nice thing to do either. Um, so find a project that doesn't have a composer and that really interests you. You know, it looks awesome. You think it looks really cool. Um, and yeah, get in touch. And just say how much you like the game, you know? Just get in touch as a fan. Don't mention you're a composer. Um, because game devs here they hear, hey man, do you need some music? I'm a composer. They hear it like a hundred times a day. Every time they post something, a hundred composers are coming in and saying, hey, do you need music? Hey, do you need music? Hey, do you need music? Um, so it's best to start with just, just saying, hey, I'm a fan, you know, I'm a fan of the game. Your game looks awesome. I love that you did this. I love these uh, particle physics. Um, your art style is really cool. Um, wow, that animation looks so fluid. You know, just be honest because you're already interested in the project. You should be able to be very honest and say what you like about it. And you want to try to build up a rapport with the um, the game developer, you know? Try to get a bit of backwards and forwards. Don't just say, hey man, I like your game. And he says, that's great. And then say, by the way, I'm a composer, do you want music? They'll they'll immediately just say, oh no, it's not the composer, this is terrible. Um, so just try to be involved. Try to build up a rapport, a conversation. Um, and the Composer Code website recommends adding value. It's something that's going to improve their game. And this could be from playtesting, feedback, uh, advice, you know, you might, for example, I saw a post on Twitter the other day and the shotgun was fired, but the, the sound of the shotgun wasn't in sync with the shotgun. And so I just said to the, I said, hey, this game looks awesome, looks absolutely fantastic, I love the graphic style. And then right at the end I just said, I feel like the sound in the, shot, the shotgun's a little bit out of sync. Uh, and I worked out it was early, I think it was. I just said, hey, it feels like it's a little bit early. And the developer said, oh yeah, you're totally right. I had a look and uh, it wasn't in sync. So thanks for that. And so straight away, I've helped to make make their game better. Because that's that's really what our job is as a composer. Improve the game, make the game better. It doesn't have to be through music. It could be through playtesting, through giving feedback on, hey, I think this tutorial's too long. Or, you know, you could be a playtester. We play games, so we can, we can playtest. And then once you've kind of, while you're building up this rapport and trying to add value to the game, you know, don't don't be crazy about it, don't be a dick about it, but like that, no one wants to be criticized massively. Um, but just try to be positive and uh, see if you can help them improve it. While you're doing that, you want to start writing a pitch or a demo. So you want to try get some footage of their game. Um, so you could use something like OBS Studio and just record whatever it is videos you can find, whether it's on um, Twitter or using like a YouTube downloader to download a YouTube video um, or a mixture of the both. Just try to get some footage of their game, um, edit it together into some kind of um, video, whether it's two or three minutes, and then start to write music to it. And tr you've got to write the best track you can. It has to be your highest quality work because there's really no excuses um, for this demo to be uh, of low quality because you've got no time pressure. Um, if you do a kind of average job and you send it to them, then the question is, how will you perform when there is time pressure? If you're, if you're already doing kind of an average to low quality job and then they put time pressure on you, hey, this needs to be finished in a week, suddenly your, your quality is gonna go down even more. So we need to start at the highest possible quality and then when the time pressure comes on, hopefully your quality will stay up there, but if it does, it'll only slightly decrease to make it a little bit uh, lower quality. But Ideally, we want to always do the best work we can, if we, especially when we're pitching to a developer. This is the first time they've heard uh, music. We want to do an absolutely amazing job and just blow them out of their seat if possible. Uh, yeah, so once you've got your demo ready, um, usually I upload it to YouTube as unlisted um, because we, right now we don't know if the, develop, the developer um, wants us to share the, the video. They might not want us to share a video with our music or maybe the footage is really old and they don't. It, do, it doesn't feel like it represents the game anymore. So it's good to put it as an unlisted video 
And that way only the developer can see it. Only the people you send the link to can see it. Um, Cause if you straight away say, oh, here's a video of your game with new music and it's public on YouTube. Developer will say, oh no, that's no good. Uh, actually, I already have a composer in mind and now there's this big public thing going on where people think you're the composer, but this is really awkward. You know, we don't want to make an awkward situation for the game developer. So it's usually a good idea to just start, start off as unlisted. And then after you talk to them, you can then talk about, hey, um, can I share this on my Twitter or, or something like. Um, so once that's ready, we'll send the developer our pitch. Um, so at this point, you can tell them you're a composer and you're going to have footage of their game with your music and that's going to draw them in much more than a random portfolio video. If you're sending portfolio videos around, it's not as effective. Um, you can still kind of just cold call developers, send your portfolio to a hundred different developers and it can work. Um, it's probably quite a low, um, a low percentage that will actually work there. But if you send a developer some footage of their game, they can instantly say, oh, that's my game. That's, that's great. I want to see it. Um, and then you put your music in there. Suddenly they've got um, kind of a reason to watch the video. They say, okay, let's see. Let's see what this guy's done with my game footage. Let's see, you know, what kind of music he's made. And it'll, it'll draw them in. 100% they'll, they'll watch it, certainly. Um, and so, yeah, at that point you can kind of say, hey, by the way, I'm a composer. Here's some uh, music I wrote for your game. Let me know what you think. And then they'll get back to you and they'll say, this is great. Or, oh, hey, this is cool, but I already have someone else in mind. Or, um, hey, thanks for that, but I'm not, uh, we're not looking for music at the moment. Um, there's, a, there's a variety of different um, responses you'll get to that. Um, and after you've gone through that response phase um, and work out what, what the deal is, do they want to hire you? Do they, do they, are they, maybe they don't have a budget for audio and you have to kind of pass. Um, some people might say, uh, what do you want to do with this project? Do you want to be a collaborator or a contractor? You know, do you want to get paid or do you want to kind of just work for free on this? And at that point, I'd usually say, I can't really work, work for free, but um, I think your game's great. And if you do get um, budget for audio, 100% hit me up and I'll, I'll write your music. Uh, but some people might, might say, hey, yeah, that's great. I'll work on it for free if they want to build up a, a, their portfolio. And then after that, you can, you can say, hey, do you mind if I share this footage on Twitter, on my Twitter or my YouTube or whatever? And they'll, they'll let you know. Um, so recently I did a a pitch for a developer. It was using some footage of theirs and I asked them if I could share it and they said, hey, that footage is really old. I'd prefer if you didn't share that footage. Um, and so I said, yep, okay, fine. So I just uh, created a new video with just my DAW working and no game footage and I just posted that because I mean, I own the music. Um, I didn't post anything about their game. And so, you know, but at least I checked first. It would be a bit impolite to just start posting their game everywhere with new music. So you've got to be a bit, a bit careful about how you treat their intellectual property. All right, what to do with your demos. And this is once again from, um, I've got to remember his name. Let me go back and remember his name. Matt Kenyon. Okay, this is from Matt Kenyon again. Um, what to do with your demos. Because right now you're pitching to developers. You're creating a really, really high quality track to send out to a developer. And what happens if they say, no, we're not actually that keen, or we have a composer, or that style doesn't work for us. Suddenly you have a, a very nice track that isn't going to be used. And so what you should do is assemble all these into asset packs. And in fact, sorry, this doesn't come from, from Matt, Matt Kenyon. It comes from Stephen Malin. Um, it's always a combination of those two with, with me. I, I get all the information and, and bundle it together. Um, but Stephen Malin, uh, actually, I think it was um, his idea to actually um, put the stuff together. So... You want to take your finished tracks and assemble them into asset packs. So you group your like tracks together into a themed package. So it could be, you know, all these fantasy tracks I've done, or all these science fiction tracks, or um, uh, Dark Ambient, for example. I did a whole bunch of tracks for like a Quake mod that never really got released. And so I just bundled them all together into a Dark Ambient, um, Dark Ambient album. And it's, it's sold a few copies, so it's, not, it's better, than, better than nothing. Uh, you can hire an artist to make a cover or do the cover yourself. And the idea is that you never waste a track. Uh, so it's a really good way to put your tracks to use. Um, and now you can upload them to itch.io, the Unity Asset Store, and Game Dev Market, among others. You can, there's a few different places. There's also um, 
kind of music licensing um, websites um, like Audio Jungle and such like that you can upload to. Um, and obviously Stephen Malin has an excellent video on this, which I will um, link below on how to actually upload to these places and who, who to pitch to. And, and you can, there is actually a way to uh, create asset packs from scratch where you kind of look at what's available and try to find a niche that isn't covered and something that you'd be very good at. So you kind of mark, do like a targeted marketing um, to create an asset pack. Um, and that's, that's also another way to do it. So there's kind of two ways you can deal with asset packs there. Either just using your old tracks that you don't want to waste, or you can specifically write one to say, hey, I want to try to make some money here. Let's try to create a, something that no one else has done. And this will help you build up an a, a, a passive income. So you do a bit of work at the start, and then these things just exist and can be bought at any time in the future. They just sit there and make you money, ideally. Um, and especially if you're going for the um, kind of contracting composer, um, the, let me, let me remember what it's called, freelance. Yeah, that's right. A freelance composer, this is going to be really helpful for you. And things like asset packs, music licensing, also courses, creating courses on whatever it is you're feeling confident about. Whatever you think you have a lot of knowledge about, it could be production, it could be composition, it could be uh, marketing, um, it could be you know researching different music styles or whatever. Uh, whatever you are confident in and feel like you have knowledge you can share, create a course. You know, it'll take you a bit of money and time to set up, but I think it's well worth it. Um, streaming um, and downloads, streaming services, you can make money through that passive income, as well as ad revenue um, and affiliate kind of marketing that kind of stuff. Uh, you can look more into that if you're interested. Okay, pricing. How much should we charge for our music? Now, generally, composers charge by the finished minute of music. So that's one minute of music that's completely finished and ready to go. If it's a three-minute track, we're going to charge, um, you know, th for, th for three minutes. But it's all based on our single finished minute um, rate. So, for example, I might charge $100 per finished minute. If I have a three-minute track, it'll be $300. Um, and this should be based on kind of how much how long it takes you to write a minute of music if you um if it takes you two hours to write a, a minute of music then maybe your um pricing will be a little bit lower if it takes you four hours maybe it'll be a little bit higher um, if it takes you 10 hours it'll be be much much higher so it depends on how long it takes you uh, and it can also depend on the type of um music being written if it's um, like solo guitar or something and very very relaxed and easy stuff um, it's not going to be as hard to do if it's full orchestra it's going to take a lot longer to write each minute um, and it's not always um, it's not always a stable rate you know um, different minutes might might take you a different amount of time so you kind of want to get an average and then usually in a contract I'll price out and say hey okay I'll write the score for you I'm going to charge you whatever it is a hundred dollars US per finished minute and that's just um, static kind of price so whatever I do for them will be a hundred dollars per per punishment and, and that'll kind of it'll balance out over the course of time if some of them are very easy I'll make a bit more money if some are very hard I'll make a bit less money but mostly I'll try to get it around the right the right rate and you kind of want to decide on an hourly rate that you want to make and remember that once you're full-time you'll need to cover your own uh, in New Zealand we have something called ACC which is a kind of a health insurance um, your holidays, sick pay, all your costs. You kind of need to factor in how much money do you need to make a year and then um, work out uh, how much time you're actually going to spend writing music during that year. You've got to take into account um, you might have sick days, you'll have holidays, you probably don't want to work seven days a week, you probably want to work five days a week. Um, so you need to factor all that in to work out how much, um, what, what your hourly rate might be. Um, and in New Zealand, it might be uh, probably above $35 an hour. It's probably going to be, you know, $40, $50 an hour. It's going to be, could be about right for um, in New Zealand. Now, professional composers charge between $300 and $1,000 US per finished minute. Um, larger productions may cost even more, especially if there's like live musicians involved. Um, so, yeah, keep that in mind. Um, but you might probably want to start lower um, because to start with, you, you may not have a big, um, re your reputation is very kind of unknown. People don't know you, you don't have a reputation. 
Um, so you, you can't charge as much. As your reputation grows, you can charge more and more. Like John Williams can probably charge $10,000 per finished minute or whatever it is, you know, because he's got a massive reputation that he's built up over 50, 60 years. So you probably want to start around maybe 60 to 70 US dollars per minute, per finished minute. Um, and each time you finish a job, you should ideally charge 30% more for the next one. Um, so each time you finish one, you should um, up your up your price a little bit. And don't be afraid to write one free track as well for a potential customer. Uh, writing a free track is always a good thing to do. Um, you might say, hey, I'm just, you know, hey, I love your game, it's really cool, let me, let me write your free track. And, they'll say, and like, no one's going to turn down some free music. They'll say, oh, great, yeah, I'll see what you can do, sure. They've got nothing to lose, so it's also a good way to get in there. Um, but yeah, don't forget to, you should raise your prices by 30% after each finished job. Um, and see how it goes. Some people feel bad about, you know, um, charging too much, but you know, don't feel bad because this is, uh, this is your, your livelihood. You've got to be able to make a living from your, from your music. And that means, you know, covering your food, power, rent, internet costs, um, you know, having a little bit of extra money to actually buy some new equipment. Um, going on holidays you know you don't want to be working yourself to, to the bone every day you know 78 hours a week you want to be working you know 30 40 hours maximum um, and have time to be with your family with your loved ones time to just relax you know you can't you just can't work all day every day because you'll burn out and you, your brain will explode um, you want to have a good balance between relaxing and working and so when you do work you need to charge enough that it actually covers your bills and you know make, maybe makes you a little bit of money as well Okay, contracts and intellectual property. So the first rule is don't give away ownership of your tr ownership of your tracks unless you are paid buyout rates, um, which can be up to four times your usual rate. So usually I like to. Uh, sorry, sorry. Let me just go, I'll just go through this. All the information's here. I should go through it in order, not just jump through. So in a buyout, you no longer own your music for the rest of time. The company will say, okay, yep, write us this music, we now own your music. So in order to do that, they need to pay you a lot more than they usually would. So when I was talking about $300 um, US per minute, you probably want to charge a lot more than that if they're going to be um, owning your music afterwards. So there's contract templates you can find online. Um, it's always good to have a lawyer look at them, especially if it's a larger job. So if you're in doubt, you know, take them to a lawyer and, and check things out, see what they say, and make sure you're not going to get screwed or, um, you know, make sure it's um, a decent looking contract. Uh, now, personally, I like to use an exclusive license, which allows the game designer to use my tracks for anything to do with their game, uh, but not any sequels, just for the, the first game, whatever it is, um, and they can use that for the rest of the time. So it's exclusive. I won't sell or give those tracks to any other project. So they're, they're the only game or project that can have my, my music, that, that specific music. I'm not gonna put them in an asset pack. I'm not gonna sell them to another game or another film or anything. You know, it's exclusive. So they can feel like the music is you know specific for their game, but it's a license, you know? The intellectual property remains m mine as the composer. It remains yours. Uh, you can sell the official soundtrack and you'll make any money from the official soundtrack. And I think it's a good thing to do because, you know, you made the soundtrack, it should be your um, property, really. You should be able to sell it and make money from it. Why would the game developer make money from your soundtrack, you know? Um, so I think that's a good thing to do, the exclusive license. Uh, it's also nice to have a clause allowing you to use some game footage for promotional material, such as your um, portfolio video, for example. It's really good to be able to have some of that game footage in your portfolio video. And it's good to have that in the contract as well. Um, so that you can, you know, actually officially say, hey, look, you said I could use the art and it's in the contract. So, you know, make sure, you know, I need to be able to use some kind of footage or artwork in the official soundtrack. Um, so if I'm selling the soundtrack, uh, I can put some of the game art in there. And if I'm making a promo video, I need to be able to show, hey, I've actually worked on games and have real game footage in there. So. It's good to have that in your contract too. Now, contracts aren't gonna, you know, contracts. Um, how do I how do I word this? People will still kind of do whatever they want. They they could still go against 
against a contract and you might actually have a hard time enforcing a contract. But uh, Matt Kimian says contracts are like security cameras. They act as a de de deterrent to misconduct. So they may not stop things altogether, but they kind of, you know, they just deter people from doing the wrong thing. Um, you know, legally, they could probably screw you and then you'd have a really hard time getting the money out of them because maybe they're in a different country and it's just a random contract um, and it might cost you a lot of money to actually get in, involved legally um, to try to get um, whatever it is you're trying to get. Um, but it's good to have them there to start with. It's like a security camera, you know, they're going to prevent if someone, if you have a contract with someone, that person's going to say, oh, I've got a contract, I should probably pay them. Um, you know, it's signed and official. Um, like most people aren't going to try to just screw you, um, especially if you have a contract. But if you don't have a contract, you leave it wide open for anything to happen. You know, people could say, well, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm not paying you. I no longer have the budget to this project, so I can't pay you. You know, there could be all sorts of problems. And generally, don't start work without a, without a contract. Um, always a good idea to have a contract first before you start doing anything. Don't put any time into it, um, except for like the pitching and such like. Um, don't put anything in like officially until you have a contract. All right, invoicing. Uh, so invoice can be done for hourly or finished minute of work. So you might, depending on the um, game dev, you might, they might say, hey, I'm gonna pay you an hourly rate. I wanna, uh, uh, the funding I got, uh, it needs to be uh, paid invoiced hourly or whatever it is. I need, I'll pay you whatever, 50 bucks an hour or whatever. Um, so depending on your, the game developer, you might have to charge hourly or per finished minute. So an invoice generally needs seven things. It needs a date, and there's our date there, where the date was, in, was issued. Um, an invoice number, so you can keep track of things. There's an invoice number there. Uh, generally name of the tracks or the work, and there's my there's the name there. This is just an example invoice, by the way. With the, uh, and kind of a time spent, or total the total time written of, of tracks. And so here's the length, it shows how long that track is. And then you've got your rate. So this is the cost per minute. It's a four minute and two second track. Cost is 100 US per minute. And then that's our total. And then the grand total down the bottom. If there are multiple tracks, you'd have a grand total would tally them all up. And you can set up an Excel sheet to, you know, as a template to, to set the stuff up and just have, you know, the cell tallies all these, these um, ones and this cell tallies these two together. So you can, you can set up an Excel sheet to do this. You can probably find um, uh, templates online as well. You also want your payment details, like a PayPal or a bank account number. And on my invoices, they're down the bottom. You can't see it in here, but it's, it was a bit awkward for the whole invoice on the page. And also don't really want to hand up my bank account information online. Um, and you can also include things like payment required within 30 days of invoice, if you, you want to, you know, if you're having trouble with people paying you on time. Generally, as soon as I invoice, someone's going to, um, they pay me pretty quickly within, within a day or so. Um, but generally, send your invoice right after you've finished the track. Once it's finished and you've given it to them, send your invoice straight away. Don't wait too long. Um, with GST, uh, if you're going to think, you could, and this is for New Zealand, you, this might be different um, overseas. If you think you're going to make over $60,000 per annum, you need to register for GST. Um, so it might be a wee way off uh, before you get to that point, but yeah, at, at some point you're going to register for GST as well, and that's 15% of the total it will be increased, and you'll um, they'll have to pay you 15% extra, and that'll go to GST, which is a global sales tax. And yeah, that's pretty much it for the um, game music business. I hope it's been helpful. I'm trying to just share whatever um, I know or have learned about this topic. I'm still learning a lot. Trying to learn more about marketing and um, pitching to developers and you know all that kind of stuff um, and learning more about contracts you know there's lots and lots of detail there that it can be good to go over with a lawyer or something um, to try to learn more about it and be more accurate and yes yeah, just remember to build up your online presence study your scores do research you know find out ways to make your music better um, and be kind to people add value to games and pitch to developers regularly. So do all those things and you should start getting work and just keep being consistent, making great music. And yeah, so I hope that's been uh, helpful to everyone. 
and I'll probably see you around on the internet. Feel free to drop by and say hi on my Twitter or um, uh, in any of the discords that we're in. Um, and yeah, good luck everyone. I uh, hope you all find a career in uh, video game music or maybe film music. A lot of the stuff applies to film music as well. So yeah, best of luck everyone and take it easy. Bye.